This is William Michael of the Classical Liberal Arts Academy. And in this talk, I'd like to provide students in the Academy's classical grammar course with some help making their first reading of lesson one in classical grammar. You may wonder uh, what the purpose of this classical grammar course is since we already have an elementary English grammar course and we already have Latin and Greek grammar courses. What's the purpose of this classical grammar course? This course is intended to teach English grammar, but it's teaching English grammar to students who are going to go on to study Latin and Greek grammar. So this course is intended to teach concepts in English grammar, teach about how the English language works in a way that will help you when you begin the study of Latin and or Greek grammar. So classical grammar is an English grammar course intended for students who will be working through the classical languages. That's the purpose of classical grammar. In this first lesson, you can see the title of the lesson is The English Letters. So let's just make our first reading of this lesson and walk through this uh, lesson on the English letters. The lesson begins with an introduction that reads, Welcome to the Classical Grammar Course in the Classical Liberal Arts Academy. In this lesson, we will begin the study of English letters. To study this lesson well, follow the instructions given in the article, How to Study for Mastery. And if you've never read that article where I provide some instructions, for how to study with, uh, for mastery, you should take some time and look over that article. It'll take you some time to get used to studying in the way that I explain, but that article will be really helpful for your future studies and helping you to learn how to study for mastery. So let's go ahead now and get into the real stuff of the lesson. The first rule that we read in classical grammar has to do with the English alphabet, the letters of the English language. We read, the English language has 26 letters, and then we have the letters listed. I trust that you already know the alphabet. But we learn that the English language has 26 letters, and you may say, give me a break, this is so easy, everybody knows this. That's true. We, we all do know about the English alphabet. But what I want you to understand is that the different uh, languages that we're going to study, English, Latin, Greek, and so on, they don't all have the same number of letters. In fact, English has more letters than Latin and Greek. In English, we learn that the language has 26 letters. That means that we use 26 different written letter symbols to share ideas in English. There are 26 letters in the English alphabet. What is important, if you're a younger student, is to make sure that you know the uppercase and lowercase forms of each letter in the English alphabet. But for most students in this course, this is already well known. So let's continue and look at the explanation of this first rule. As we study languages in the Classical Liberal Arts Academy, we will find that Greek, Latin, and English use a different number of letters. Greek uses 24 letters. Latin uses 23 letters, and English uses 26 Note that we are not saying that there are 26 sounds in English, but letters. We're not saying that there are 26 different sounds in English, but 26 different letters. Unlike Greek and Latin, English letters can be used to represent a number of different sounds. Let me repeat that. Unlike Greek and Latin, 
English letters can be used to represent a number of different sounds. Now, when you're learning to read and spell in English, you'll often have a very difficult time. You'll learn rules, but then you'll see that those rules don't always work. And some students get very greatly confused because English is a very confusing language. And the reason why English is so difficult to learn when you're getting started is because letters in English can represent a number of different sounds. And this is not true in classical Greek and Latin. In classical Greek, we learn that there are 24 letters, and that means that there are 24 different sounds used in Greek. The same is true of Latin with 23 letters, but in English, there are many more sounds that are represented in different ways with different letters, and things can get very confusing when it's time to read a word you've never seen before or spell a word that you've never seen before because you can't simply think about what letter represents each sound and write that letter. It's more complicated than that, and you really need to work hard to learn to read and spell correctly in English. So if you've had trouble in English grammar with, with reading and spelling, don't assume that you're just not smart enough because that's, that's not necessarily true. The language is a confusing, difficult language to learn, and it just takes time. So keep working and be patient. The English language has 26 letters. Let's go on to the next rule. Letters which can be sounded by themselves are called vowels. Letters which can be sounded by themselves are called vowels, and in English there are five vowels. And the names of the five vowels are A, E, I, O, and U. A, E, I, O, and U. These are the five vowels of the English alphabet. And vowels are letters that can be sounded by themselves. And this will make more sense later after we've learned what a consonant is. The lesson reads, The English word vowel is derived, or it comes from, the Latin word vox, which means voice. So the word vowel means voice. These five letters, A, E, I, O, and U, are used to represent a number of different sounds, all of which are vowels. Vowels are letters that represent sounds that can form syllables by themselves. So we see in the rule there that letters which can be sounded by themselves are called vowels. And as I mentioned, it's, it's hard to understand what that's referring to until we've had a chance to learn about consonants, but I'll give you a, a quick explanation. If you think about any consonant, like the letter B or C or D, F, G, and so on, the consonant sounds, the consonant letters that represent the sounds, cannot be spoken by themselves. It's impossible to pronounce the letter D without adding a sound to it, a vowel sound. If I ask you what sound does the letter D make, you'll probably say it makes the sound duh, duh. And the problem there is you see you're adding the sound uh to the sound of the letter D. That's because consonants cannot be spoken by themselves. They must be joined to vowels in order to be spoken. So a vowel is a letter that can be spoken by itself. A vowel is a letter that can be spoken by itself. And there are five of them in English. A, E, I, O, and U. That's rule number two. Let's go on to rule number three. Two vowels coming together 
in one syllable, I should add, two vowels coming together in one syllable form a diphthong. And you need to make sure you pronounce that word correctly. Some students say diphthong. That's not correct. It's diphthong, diphthong. Two vowels coming together in a syllable form a diphthong. They do this when the two sounds are blended into one sound so that neither of them is lost. So two vowels coming together and blending together to form one sound so that, or I should say, in a way that neither of the sounds is lost, but they're both blended together and present in the sound. Those two vowels are called a diphthong. And the word diphthong simply means double sound, as we'll see later in the explanation. Two vowels coming together form a diphthong when the two sounds are blended into one so that neither of them is quite lost. The only proper or true diphthongs in our language, in the English language, are EU, OI, and OU. EU, OI, and OU. These are the only true diphthongs in English. But two vowels are often used to mark a simple vowel sound in English. So sometimes in English, we'll have two vowels together, but they're just a symbol of a simple vowel sound, not a diphthong. So make sure you understand that a diphthong is two sounds coming together in a syllable that are blended together, but both of the sounds of the original letters remain heard. They're simply combined into one syllable. Let's read the lesson explanation now. Before learning of a diphthong, we must understand the relationship between vowels and syllables. Normally, every syllable in a word expresses a single vowel sound. So, words can be divided into parts. One way to divide words into parts would be to divide a word into the letters that are the parts of a word. But because vowels are special, vowels are the main sound of each syllable. Therefore, normally, the word can be divided into parts where each vowel marks a different part of the word. And these parts of words are called syllables. So before learning about a diphthong, we have to understand the relationship between vowels and syllables. Every syllable in a word normally expresses a single vowel sound. For example, in the word English, English, there are two vowel sounds, the e of the first letter e and the i of the letter i. There are two vowels in the word English. And since there are two vowels, there are also two syllables. English. Two syllables. Two vowel sounds, two syllables. In the word understanding, understanding, we can hear that there are four syllables. Un, der, stan, ding. Four syllables. And there are also four vowel sounds, a, u, e, i. So there are four vowel sounds, and therefore there are four syllables. So we see that there's a relationship between syllables and vowels in words. And it's important for us to understand that because that helps us to understand what's special about a diphthong. We said that normally, normally, every syllable expresses a single vowel sound. And we looked at two examples, English and understanding. A diphthong is a special pair of vowels that do not separate into two different syllables. 
So what makes a diphthong special is that both vowels are kept in one syllable. A diphthong is a special pair of vowels that are not sounded, not spoken in separate syllables, but are sounded together in one syllable. The word diphthong comes from the Greek word di, which means two, and thongoi, which means sounds. So diphthong means two sounds. And so a diphthong is a pair of vowels, or two sounds, that are not divided, but are spoken together in one syllable. That's what makes a diphthong important, and you have to learn the rule about diphthongs so you can identify diphthongs when you read them and make sure you pronounce them as one syllable together. Now, in the rule, we also learn about proper diphthongs, proper diphthongs, and the lesson explains. The proper diphthongs are those that actually fulfill the definition of a diphthong given above. So proper or real diphthongs are those that match that definition of what a diphthong is. Those are proper diphthongs. Both letters represent a sound, and both sounds are spoken together in one syllable. That is the mark of a proper or a true or real diphthong. There are also improper diphthongs. An improper diphthong is a pair of vowel letters that are kept together in a syllable but are not spoken as two sounds joined together. A good example of this is in the word head, H-E-A-D. In that word head, we see two vowels, E and A. And the normal rule would say that since there's two vowels in the word, it should have two syllables. So we would say head, head. But when we hear the word spoken correctly, we find that that's not how it's read, and there are, there's only one syllable. We read that word head. So we have these two sounds, E and A, joined together in speech, and they're in one syllable together, but they're not a diphthong. They're not a diphthong because the sound of both vowels is not present when we pronounce that syllable. We simply pronounce the short E sound, eh, and we say head. We don't pronounce the letter A at all, so since there's not two sounds blending together to form one sound, we do not have a proper diphthong. So there are proper or real diphthongs and then improper diphthongs, which are pairs of vowels that look like diphthongs and may even work a little bit like diphthongs because they stay together in a syllable, but they, they do not fulfill the definition of a diphthong because we don't hear both sounds of the letters in the pronunciation of those two letters together. So make sure you understand what a diphthong is and make sure you understand the difference between a proper and an improper diphthong. Let's go on to rule number four. Those letters which cannot be sounded by themselves, those letters which cannot be sounded by themselves are called consonants. So we've already learned about vowels and the five vowels in the English language, A, E, I, O, and U. Now we learn about the other 21 letters in English. The other 21 letters are called consonants. Vowels are letters that can be pronounced by themselves in speech. And as I showed you before, consonants are letters which cannot be sounded by themselves, but must be joined to a vowel in order to be pronounced. So it's important to understand the difference between vowels and consonants. Let's read the explanation. There are 26 letters used in English, and five of them 
are vowels. Therefore, 21 of the English letters are not used to represent sounds that can be spoken by themselves. These letters are called consonants. And this word, consonant, is derived from the Latin words cum, which means with, and sonantes, which means sounding. So consonants are letters that must be sounded together with vowels, as we learned before. So that's what the word consonants means. It means uh, things that are sounded together. And we know that in grammar, that means with vowels. So there are 26 letters in the alphabet. Five are vowels and 21 are consonants. When we say that consonants are letters that cannot be sounded by themselves, we do not simply mean that they can be combined with other consonants, for they would still not be able to be sounded. So we're not just saying that consonants are letters that must be joined to other letters because it still wouldn't work unless we have a vowel. Consonants are letters that are spoken when joined together with vowels. What we mean is that they must be sounded with a vowel. Consonants must be sounded with a vowel forming a syllable. Consonants are letters which cannot form a syllable by themselves. Consonants are letters which cannot form a syllable by themselves, but must be joined to a vowel sound. Next, we learn about the organs of speech. We learn the different parts of the mouth, the different parts of the mouth, principally the palate. That's the top of the inside of your mouth. The different parts of the mouth, principally the palate, the tongue, and the lips are called the organs of speech. So the parts of your body that you use to speak, and that would include the palate of your mouth, your tongue, your lips, your teeth, and so on, these are called organs of speech. These are the organs that we use to speak. The vowel sounds, if you pay attention to your pronunciation, the vowel sounds are formed by the voice passing through the cavity of the mouth, more or less enlarged in different directions. So when you make a sound with your voice, it's air coming up through your um, what are called vocal cords and then through your mouth, sometimes even through your nose, and those sounds are made by what are called the organs of speech. Vowel sounds are formed when the voice passes through the mouth with no interference. The palate, tongue, and lips don't do any work for us to pronounce a vowel. The sound simply comes up through our vocal cords and out our mouth or out our nose. The difference with consonants is that when we speak a consonant, there is always some pressing, some action of the organs of speech. We use the organs of speech ultimately to make consonant sounds, to block the sounds of vowels. No consonant can be spoken or heard without some helping sound. If it has not the distinct sound of a vowel, it must have something of a hiss, hum, or breathing. So there's got to be some other sound that's made when a consonant is pronounced. So that's rule number four. Make sure you understand how many consonants there, there are what the consonants are, and then also understand this brief lesson on the organs of speech, how speech is actually made. Let's move on to rule number five. The letter Y is a consonant when it stands at the beginning of a word or syllable. 
The letter Y, we learn, is a strange word. Sometimes it can be a consonant, and sometimes it can act like a vowel. It acts like a consonant when it stands at the beginning of a word or syllable. So if you think about the word yes, yes, the basic vowel sound is e. Eh. It's one syllable, and the vowel sound is e. Eh. But if we look at the word and we pronounce the word the the, uh, the letter y with the sound y y, we have to ask what exactly is going on because the letter y almost seems like a vowel, and the letter is sort of in between a vowel and a consonant. When the vowel comes, or I should say, when the letter Y comes at the beginning of a word or the beginning of a syllable, it's pronounced like a consonant, like the letter Y in yes or yellow. But if the letter Y comes at any other place in the word, it usually is read like a vowel and not like a consonant. So that's rule number five about the letter Y. The letter 6 teaches us that the letter W after a vowel in the same syllable is also a mere vowel. So if the letter W comes after a vowel in a syllable, that letter W should be treated like a vowel. The letter W after a vowel in the same syllable is also a mere vowel. The letter W is a consonant for it can never form a syllable without a vowel being added to it. The rule here states that the letter W follows a vowel in a syllable, or when it does, it functions like a vowel. We see this in words like law, L-A-W, cow, C-O-W, and so on. So the letter W coming after a vowel and being in one syllable with that vowel also acts like a mere vowel. In other places, it acts like a consonant. So that's an important lesson to learn. And then lastly, rule number seven, we read vowels pronounced by themselves or with consonants form syllables. Vowels pronounced by themselves or with other consonants, joined together with other consonants, are, form syllables. Syllables by themselves or with other syllables form words. Syllables by themselves or with other syllables form words. Words are used as signs of our ideas. Words are used to communicate ideas that we have by acting as signs of ideas. Words are put together to form sentences. Words are joined together in speech to form sentences. And these sentences express thoughts, opinions, and so on. So in this rule, rule number seven, make sure you understand what syllables are, what words actually are, and how words are formed. Make sure you understand what words are, that they are signs of ideas, and also understand how sentences are formed out of words. So rule number seven is also a great lesson on vowels and syllables and how words are actually built and whole sentences formed. The lesson explains a syllable is a sound or a combination of sounds expressed in a single breath. A word is a combination of syllables used to express an idea. Don't get spoken and written words confused. Spoken words are used to express ideas. Spoken words are used to express ideas ideas. Written words are not used to express ideas, but they're used to express spoken words. So we write down what we would say. We, we symbolize the spoken words with written words.
when we wish to join ideas together to express a judgment, a wish, a command, or a question, we form what are called sentences. We speak in sentences, and sentences are made of words. Therefore, words are called the parts of speech. Just as before we saw that syllables are the parts of words, we see here that words are the parts of speech. And that's, that's all that's included in this first lesson. There are seven rules, and we've read through the rules and their explanations. So let's, let's read the conclusion together and wrap up this lesson. In this lesson, we study the letters of the English language. The study is called orthography. The study of letters and sounds is called orthography. It is the study of the letters and sounds of a language. We learned that letters are joined together to make syllables. Syllables are joined together to make words. Words are joined together to make sentences. At the end of the lesson, we learned that words are the parts of speech. In the second part of grammar, we will study etymology. So here we're studying orthography. That's the first part of the art of grammar. But in the second part of grammar, we're going to study etymology, the second part, which is the study of the parts of speech. So as we end this lesson talking about the parts of speech, we should expect that the next lesson is going to make demands of us and assume that we know what the parts of speech are. So that's all for lesson one here. My goal in this talk was simply to provide you with a, a helpful walk through the lesson. Now it's time for you to make this study your own, to read through the lesson on your own, study it carefully, um, complete the assessments in the lesson, and so on. And hopefully you'll find this video helpful in getting you ready to do that. If you've got any questions about these lessons in the Classical Liberal Arts Academy, just post your questions in the student forums on the course pages. That's the best way for you to get help. And if there's anything you'd like to share privately or something you'd like to talk about in more detail, just get in touch with me anytime by sending an email to mail at classicalliberalarts.com. I hope that's a helpful walk through this first lesson. Now it's time for you to study the lesson for yourself and study it for mastery. God bless your studies.